Good morning, everyone. Uh, today is Thursday, <clears throat> April 2nd, and um, my goodness, this is the third week, almost the end of the third week of this very strange social isolation everyone's going through. Um, just want to let you know that uh, t I speak to my fellow teachers all the time, and we are all thinking of you guys. Um, <clears throat> we care about you, and we miss you, and I hope you know that because um, we really are uh, concerned that you're all doing well. We really want to know that you're doing well. And that, that's our fondest hope. Okay, I just want to start with that. Um, today I want to talk about Chapter 11 of A Wrinkle in Time. <clears throat> One of the things that I, I think is really interesting about these last couple of chapters with these creatures from Ixchel is that they are... Um, it's it's about appearances. It's about um, whether appearances matter or not. So these these creatures show up, right? These these creatures from Ixchel show up while um, Meg, Charles, Wal no, sorry, Meg, Calvin, and Mister Murray are very vulnerable. I mean, Meg is paralyzed, and the other two guys are they they don't know where they are. They don't know what to do. They just made this um, desperate escape from. Uh, from it, from Kemzatz. So they're on this planet, and uh, these creatures show up, and they're sort of like a cross between Chewbacca and an octopus, you know, like, you know, the tentacles for the hands and all that. And they come, and um, so their appearance is quite scary. But the, um, <clears throat> the sense of who they are is very different. You, you get a sense that these creatures despite their weirdness, are very good. That the, they, they really are creatures who live for um, live for treating others well. They treat each other well. And while they don't have a, um, you know, an, an advanced society with technology and all that, you, you get the sense that it doesn't really matter that these, these creatures, these beings, are really um, <clears throat> very beautiful, um, despite their weird appearance. Now, um, one of those creatures um, takes Meg and heals Meg, and Meg eventually calls her Aunt Beast, which is a which is a really lovely um, name. <laughs> um, Aunt Beast is one of my favorite characters. Um, I really have always liked Aunt Beast. Um, so, <clears throat> um, Aunt Beast takes Meg, um, heals Meg, um, treats her very kindly, and then finally. Um, Aunt Beast brings Meg to the um, to the, uh, the the common room or something like that, where Calvin and Mr. Murray are eating. And I just want to read this section here. <coughs> so, um, uh, let's see. Aunt Beast put one tentacled arm around Meg's waist and led her through long, dim corridors in which she could see only shadows, and shadows of shadows, until they reached a large column chamber. Shafts of light came in from an open skylight and converged about a huge round stone table. Here were seated several of the great beasts, and Calvin and Mr. Murray on a stone bench that circled the table. Because the beasts were so tall, even Mr. Murray's feet did not touch the ground, and lanky Calvin's long legs dangled as though he were Charles Wallace. <clears throat> it's a nice uh, image of, like, Calvin sitting there with his feet, and he's, they're going, do, 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 you know, because these beasts are so large. The hall was partially enclosed by the vaulted arches, leading to long, paved walks. There were no empty walls, no covering roofs, so that although the light was dull in comparison to Earth's sunlight, Meg had no feeling of dark or of chill. As Aunt Peace led Meg in, Mr. Murray slid down from the bench and hurried to her, putting his arms about her tenderly. They promised us you were all right, he said. <clears throat> While she had been in Aunt Peace's arms, Meg had felt safe and secure. Now her worries about Charles Wallace and her dif disappointment in her father's human fallibility rose like a gorge in her throat. I'm fine, she muttered, not looking at Calvin or her father, but at the beast for it was to them she turned out for help. It seemed to her that neither her father nor Calvin were properly concerned about Charles Wallace. As you can see, Meg is not completely healed. She's still feeling angry and resentful towards her father, who didn't rescue everything and save everything and, you know, and be, be the perfect father. 
Meg, Calvin said gaily, you've never tasted such food in your life. Come and eat. On Beast lifted Meg up to, onto the bench and sat down beside her, then heaped a plate with food, strange fruits and breads that tasted unlike anything Meg had ever eaten. Everything was dull and colorless and unappetizing to look at. And at first, even remembering the meal, Meg and Beast had fed her the night before. Meg hesitated to taste, but once she managed that first bite, she ate eagerly. It seemed she would never have her fill again. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to stop there, and <clears throat> I want to just finish with this conversation about appearance, and then I'm going to tell you what uh, assignment is going to be, and I think it should be kind of fun. So the food that um, is brought out to um, uh, to Mick, it, like like everything else on the planet, has this kind of dull, colorless quality. I I, I almost get like. Um, Everything on Ixchel is in black and white. Um, if you haven't seen the, the Wizard of Oz, there's a famous... It, it starts off and it's a black and white movie. And there's this wonderful famous scene where Dorothy's house has just landed in the land of Oz. And it's still black and white. And then she opens the door to her house and suddenly everything's in color. And it's, it's, a, really, it's a really famous scene. And, and if you watch it, um, it, it really it's very striking. However, um, <clears throat> here, it's almost like they went from some place that's color to some place that's black and white, where um, everything's very, very dull. Like, you know, even the light isn't, like, powerful. You get the feeling that maybe um, Aunt Beast tells Meg that um, Ixchel, this planet they're on, is on this, in the same solar system as Kamazots. And you get the feeling that Kamazots is probably closer to the sun, their sun, than Ixchel, and it gets, it gets better light. Um, so what I want you to think about now is first appearances as opposed to <clears throat> what something actually is. So Meg's first, I mean, the first appearance or the first, um, not appearance, um, the first, um, um, impression of the aliens are that they're these scary <laughs> Chewbacca octopuses. <blah>, you know? <laughs> they're very frightening looking, but they're very decent on the inside. Now, it's same with this meal. It looks like um, uh, Aunt Beast is giving Meg this meal, which is just like, um, I was thinking like, you know, old potatoes or something like that. There's something not very, you know, like, oh, okay, what is it? You eat it. Oh, my God, that's really good. Give me more. Um, so I want you to now write about it circumstance or situation where you had a first uh, first impression of something where you went yuck I didn't like this it could be about a person it could be about an activity it could be about a thing okay <clears throat> um, could be about a food so I'll, I'll share a, an impression one of mine which was when I was um, in my early 20s um, and I was living in Brooklyn and I had some roommates and one of my roommates made something for us. It was um, broccoli rabi cooked with garlic on semolina bread. Now, if any of you know broccoli rabi, it's, it's, it's an Italian food. Um, broccoli rabi is a very bitter food. Um, it, it's kind of it's broccoli except it's like more broccoli. It's like <laughs> take broccoli times five. That's broccoli rabi, um, and uh, so he had put it on the food and then put like this tahini sauce on top of it and then used some tamari, which is like, um, uh, like, like soy sauce. And he said, here, okay, this is what we're going to have. And, um, my first impression was we're going to have vegetables on bread. That doesn't sound so great. You know, I, I had broccoli, Robbie, and uh, my grandmother had made it. Um, and it was, um kind of intense. I, I didn't really like it that much. But then he made it and I <clears throat> okay, we put it on the put it on this the the, the uh semolina bread and had the tahini and put and and then um and I taste it and you know and I went from okay whatever this is to oh my god this is delicious and it was it was one of the most yummy meals I remember having. And um I think we'd just gone for a long walk through Brooklyn, and um, it was it was really cold, and so I think we were ready for just something really hearty and delicious. And I had this food, and I did not expect to have this food. Um, it was 
I didn't expect to enjoy this, and it was so good. I will never forget just sitting there, um, you know, not expecting to be eating something so delicious. And we just, we ate, and I think I had seconds and third, I don't know how much I had, but I had a lot. It was so good. So that was an unexpected meal for me. What I want you to write, just tell me about something unexpected. Again, it could be about a person. Um, it could be about a um, something you did. It could be about a food. Something where first imp your first impression was, yeah, I don't like this. I don't know about this. And then from you're going to go from the first impression to, hey, I really like this. This is really great. Okay? So that's your assignment. And then I'm going to pose that as a question in Google Classroom along with... Um, along with this. And please keep reading. Uh, right now we should be on chapter 11 of, um, of A Wrinkle in Time, and then we'll be finishing up by Monday. Okay? Everyone be well. Um, try to, if you can, try to get outside, get some exercise, try not to do too much screen time. I know that's hard to avoid. Um, and um, that's it. And I will talk to you tomorrow. And we have a video conference tomorrow. Okay, video conference tomorrow at 930. And I hope to see you there. Bye-bye.